Today, we're going to go over some of the prophecies now of the rest of the book of Zechariah, beginning in Zechariah 7 and verse 1. Now, we began in Zechariah 1, 1, and it was the eighth month of the second year of Darius that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. So here we are in Zechariah 7 and verse 1, a little over two years after that night of visions, which comprised the first six chapters of the book of Zechariah. So Zechariah 7 and verse 1, it says, Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month of Kislev. So that roughly corresponds to November of 518 B.C., like we said, about two years later. So chapters 7 and 8 kind of repeat and expand on the message of chapter 1, and it kind of correlates with some of the verses there. And, uh, you know, chapter 7, kind of verses 1 through 6, and you'll see a certain amount of re-emphasizing of the message. And then chapter 8 kind of corresponds more to verses 14 through 17 of chapter 1. Of course, this is all part and parcel of the Word of God. When God sent His prophets to the people, typically there was a uniformity to the messages. At the base of every message of prophecy is repentance. God's delivering a message by the mouth of the prophets, who they didn't always listen to, which I think can amaze us from time to time. But I think also if you just kind of look at the situation that we're in right now, what good do you think a prophet would do if all he came with was the word of God and said, here is what it is. And he said that to the leaders of the U.S., whoever that would be, the president of the United States, of Congress, or what have you. Well, it was no different back then. The Jews, the Israelites, they were carnal people. Even though God had given them his law, his rules, his way of life, they chose to go a way that human nature took them. Of course, that was the influence of Satan in their life, and they didn't have the benefit of God's Holy Spirit working in them, in their hearts, as we do now that we have that opportunity to have with us. But nonetheless, the, there's a repetition of messages. And God's just saying the same thing. You know, He says, repent, which basically means don't go the way that you're going, the wrong way, the carnal way. Go the godly way. Go the way that I've told you. Look at the words of the Bible, of the scripture, of the verses that you know and that you have and that have been taught to you, that have been brought to you by the mouths of the prophets and follow that. So, yeah, it's it corresponds, and we see that it's the same God, the same message, who's you know the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And, of course, it all fits perfectly together, not only within the book of Zechariah, but other books of the Bible, other minor prophets, other major prophets, etc., etc. So now, what we have here, just kind of set the scene a little bit more, is that it's also two years now to get to the end of the 70-year prophecy. The 70-year prophecy began at the time of the destruction of the previous temple. So now, many of the people are beginning to wonder, well, what next? And specifically, in these two chapters, chapters 7 and 8, about the fasts that began about the time that they went into captivity. Now, as we go through the rest of the, the books, or the rest of the chapters here, chapters 7 and 8, just want to remind you about the duality of prophecy. And specifically here is that some of these things happened to the Jews back then will also happen to the Jews in the future. And we'll just try to point those things out. I won't belabor the point because I think we've gone over it sufficiently in the past in other messages, in particular the one on the captivity and perhaps the one on the second exodus. And those are on the website for... Um, you know, you to peruse at your leisure. So continuing now in Zechariah 7 and verse 2, when the people sent Sherezer, it's, it's actually spelled differently in different translations, but uh, when he sent him with Regum Malek and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord. Now, let me just point out something real quick before we go on. It says, to the house of God in the New King James Version. A lot of other versions say Bethel, which is the better translation here. It says, it should say from Bethel as well, which is where they were coming from. And they're going to Jerusalem, to the house of God there. 
Now, of course, Bethel means house of God, but the word Bethel is never used to refer to the temple. In fact, in the next verse here, we see a reference to the temple, and it's not Bethel. We'll just we'll cover that when we get there in just a second. So, basically, these men were sent as representatives from Bethel to pray before the Lord, verse 3, and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts, the temple. So here it's referred to as house of the Lord of hosts as opposed to the house of God. And the prophets, and that's speaking of Haggai and Zechariah, saying, should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for many years? Now, again, the word there for the, the house of the Lord is different than above. The word there, it says, it's more Beth Yehovah, Sabah. So Beth Yahweh, Yehovah, as opposed to Beth El, and then Sabah, which is of hosts or of many. So again, I think that was just by way of explanation to say, yes, it's a poor translation in the New King James Version, which is the one I'm reading from. But uh, that's why we use several different versions. And also, if necessary, go back to the Hebrew, the interlinear, or the Greek, what have you. So they came from Bethel to the house of God to inquire of the priests and the prophets whether they should continue to fast. Okay, These fasts that had begun about 68 years before. So these leaders were tasked more than likely by the community of coming before the religious leaders to talk about at this point, the fast in the fifth month, which tends to be probably more germane and significant. As we go through this, we'll see that there are actually four different fasts, but this one's the first one, and it's, I think, because of that the more important one, and we'll see why, because it's the day that the temple was burned. It's the time of the, uh, the beginning of this onslaught by the uh, Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, let's turn over to Jeremiah 52. And we can see the actual event, what had happened, and why they were you know, weeping and fasting in the fifth month. Jeremiah 52, verses 12 through 17. Jeremiah 52, verses 12 through 17. Here it says, now in the fifth month, all right, the fifth month was the fast that they're talking about. And when they talked about the fifth month, again, everybody knew which fast they were talking about, okay? So in the fifth month, on the 10th day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem around. So it's not just the temple that they're, they're burning down, but all the houses and the walls. And then verse 15, we see then that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive some of the poor people. The rest of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who had deserted the king of Babylon, and the rest of the craftsmen. So he's taken, when it says some of the poor people, is because, as we'll see here in the next verse, some were left behind, just a few, right? But not the great and the mighty. Again, I'm assuming that they didn't want them to get a stronghold in the land. And he left some of there to kind of keep the, the land and whatnot. And then he also set... Uh, Gedaliah as the governor of the area. And we'll get to him in just a little bit as well. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. And then I threw in this extra verse here as well. It says, the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the carts in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. So if you recall, we were talking about the bronze pillars in chapter 6, about how it came through the mountain. And again, they have this imagery that they're looking at. And it was, I think, to a certain degree, that you know this is one that we kind of settled on, that it was the most likely kind of symbolism that they would see, especially concerning the fact 
that they're rebuilding the temple. But also here, we see that that was destroyed by the Babylonians. And so here we have a, a, a scene in the future where, okay, something symbolic to it coming out of the house of God in heaven was very similar to this. And I think something like that would have given them hope after having seen all this go down as it went. So they went to captivity, everything burned down, and then the bronze pillars were also all broken up. And if you remember, they were pretty massive uh, pillars as well. And so it was a lot of bronze that they were taking back probably, you know, for the craftsmen, for their own uh, reasons, and, you know, for their own decorations and whatever they might have been doing in Babylon with the bronze. So that's the question that these men bring before. Well, now God answers these questions, or this question, in about four different parts here in the next, uh, the rest of the verses in chapter 7, as well as chapter 8. So here we have, and we'll just call it part 1 of the answer, and it's all offset, as we see in Zechariah 7, verse 4, by some similar terminology to, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. So it's offset that way to where, okay, we see that God says to Zechariah, and Zechariah then writes down or says to the people, okay, here's the answer. Here's what you need to know and what you need to understand about your question, right? He says, say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me, for me? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? All right, so when you fast, are you doing it for me? Which you should have been doing, and they weren't. And when you eat and, and you feast, are you doing it for yourselves or are you doing it for me? Well, again, they were not going about it the wrong or the right way. So briefly here, the seventh month, this is the one of uh, Gedaliah's assassination. Okay, the Jews kept a fast. And it was on the third day of the seventh month of, of Tishri. And you might want to put just Jeremiah 41, verses 1 through 3, there in your notes. Jeremiah 41, verses 1 through 3. And it's the story of Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, who came and assassinated Gedaliah. And people became very afraid, and they, they fled out of, uh, out of the land of Judah because, again, they were afraid of what the... Babylonians may do. So anyway, that was one of the other events. Well, there's still two more. We'll just cover them briefly, but you'll see that all of them are, are Babylonian related in near the beginning of their captivity. So these are the, some of the fasts that they're keeping uh, once a month here for these four months. Now, what we do see here, okay, is the crux of the matter here at the ending of verse 5 and 6. It says... Again, did you really fast for me? Do you not eat for yourselves? So he doesn't tell them no outright or yes outright. He doesn't give them an answer. But he questions their reasons for doing what they did. So it appears that they were hoping that they could just get an outright answer out of it. And that as these 70 years are coming to close, that they could stop doing that. Because, again, fasting without water, without food for 24 hours is not pleasant. But... There is a reason for it. Now, the problem was is that they did not have the right attitude, the right focus, the right motivation. God should have been at the forefront of their minds. He should have been their number one priority. Fasting is to draw closer to God. It's to seek His will. It's to realize the need for God in our lives. Now, they seem to be doing it for selfish reasons. A lot of times they were doing it to get God to do their will. Right? It's like you're fasting to force God to do what you want, and that's backwards. It, you're to fast to try to understand what it is that God wants for you in your life. Right? They also, you know, no doubt, were doing it for self-righteous reasons as well. I mean, it, this became a problem in the New Testament times, and, and Christ called them out uh, over in Matthew 6. Um, and you can put that down in your notes if you like, but in Matthew 6, verses... 16 to 18 around there, you know, they were going out and the way that they fasted, there was like to put on appearance and go, oh, woe is me. And, and and they're trying to let everybody know how, you know, righteous that they are. And they're not by doing that. And, and they got their reward for doing that. But it says, 
you know, he says, here's how you fast. You go out, you try not to look like you're fasting. You try not to appear that way. But if you do that, God knows, you know, you can beseech him that way. He's going to hear you and he's going to reward you accordingly. That's what they were supposed to be doing. But again, they let that carnality get in the way. So Zechariah 7 and verse 7. Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous, and the south and the lowland were inhabited? So again, it's kind of just a little by way of, I guess, uh, education of the geography there. Again, Jerusalem was kind of a, a mountainous area, but then they had the uh, the other areas around there, around Judea, that were valleys and plains. So he's basically just referring to the whole area. So it's just a, a another way of saying you know this whole area. But the the main point here, though, is that he's saying, should you have not obeyed the words with the which the Lord had proclaimed through the former prophets, whenever Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous. But no, they didn't listen to the words of the prophets. Again, Christ talks about that in Matthew 23. He says, you know, Jerusalem, you're the one who kills the prophets and you stone those who are sent to you. Right? Again, that's what we were talking about before is that when the prophet came to town, told them the word of God, you know, we, we understand then that their carnality, like Romans 7 talks about, is at enmity to God. It's an enemy to God. Our way, Satan's ways, our human nature, our carnal nature, is the antithesis of God's nature. You know, God has a way, and they didn't see that. Instead, they killed these men that God had sent to them, instead of listening to them. And so because of this, you know, because they didn't listen, because they weren't fasting the right way, the, the Jews had more of a tendency to mourn their station, their lot in life at that moment, and, and not the part that they had to play in getting there. The Jews were responsible in that respect for their own captivity. You know, God did it as a lesson to them that, okay, here's what you need to be focusing on. The reason you went into captivity for, was for, you know, one, two, three, and A, B, C. But no, you're just going, oh, woe is me. Let's fast to get God to do our will to, to make our life easier and better, as opposed to have us learn our lesson. So God's trying to hear, you know, immediately focus their attention on why they should have been fasting and what their attitude should be at this point in time. And even going forward for any fasting that was to be done. So now, Zechariah 7 and verse 8, we come to the second part. Okay, and we see there again, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. So another part of this prophecy is being offset by this phraseology. Now God is reminding them of what else they should have been meditating and thinking on during these traditional fast days. The, and one of the things, the next thing, as it were, was their fellow man, how to treat them, and that the focus should be on them. Not just necessarily during fasting, but all the time. Again, when you fast, you learn something. I mean, you're supposed to draw closer to God, become more godly in that way by understanding his will better, but then we go and implement it. Right? So continuing in verse 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Verse 10, do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien, the foreigner, in other words, or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Right? So, again, very quick synopsis here of how to treat your brother your neighbor. They're one and the same. These are themes that run throughout the whole Bible. From the beginning, when Cain asks, am I my brother's keeper? And then the rest of scripture answers that in the affirmative. Yes, of course you are. And, and when he talks about justice, mercy, and compassion, again, there's other scriptures that should come to mind. 
in terms of you know what it is and again all these are huge subjects and then again how often are the widow fatherless alien and poor mentioned again this this is nothing new okay it's always been a part of god's plan but the point here is that how is it that you're to treat your brother so god says it twice here that the focus should have been on your brother not themselves as we were talking about there previously in verse 6 right they were bemoaning their station right woe is me look at what i have to do look what i have to endure yeah it's 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 selfish god says no fasting is, is toward god okay and also the attitude that you need to come out of it is one that's a good one towards your brother right and that's, that's the summation of the ten commandments anyway it's our relationship with god and our relationship with our brother that, that's what it all boils down to so continuing on in verse 11 okay what happens instead all right because their focus was wrong they were not acting in the right way towards god and towards their brother they went into captivity and now we see this in verses 11 through 14 but they refused to heed right they, they refused to listen you know when god says you know justice mercy and compassion and widow father is alien and poor they shrugged their shoulders they stopped their ears so they could not hear so they somehow wouldn't be liable for these things yes they made their hearts like flint hard refusing to hear the law and the words which the lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets yet again he brings this up thus great wrath came from the lord of hosts therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed and they would not hear so they called out and i would not listen says the lord of hosts right they didn't listen that sin separated them so that god could not hear them would not hear them but i scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known Thus the land became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. Again, I think you know, it might behoove us to stop here for just a second and turn over to Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. We can read that. To, just to understand a little bit of how it is that God works. I think a lot of times people go and they look at the Old Testament and say, Oh, I don't like the Old Testament God, I like the New Testament God. Of course, not realizing that they are one and the same and they misunderstand what it is that God's doing, what his purpose is, and what he's trying to accomplish here. But in Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, again, he gives us a very simple and straightforward analogy, right? God gave them his law, his words to live by. These are the rules for regulating their lives for the better. I mean, people get so upset about keeping the law, but it's done for their own good. I mean, how horrible is it to not kill somebody or to not be killed? And yet people somehow come up to the conclusion that this is restrictive and that it's a burden to not, what, kill somebody? Again, that's how much sense it makes. But of course, they apply it to the, the other things that they don't fully understand. Nonetheless, God looks at us like his children. And he wants to teach us and train us like his children, just like our parents do. That's why he gives us these analogies. Beginning in Hebrews 12 and verse 5, this is why God did what he did to the Jews, to the Israelites, to the people of the world, for that matter of fact. It, the things that are coming down uh, the pipe here just a little later. But Hebrews 12 verse 5 says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. So when God corrects you, the, the right response is not to become discouraged, not to go, woe is me, not to be looking inwardly at how bad my life is, but like we were talking about before. What were the set of events and actions that led up to this point? Because in verse 6, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son he receives. Every son. We are far from perfect. God is trying to build character in us to the 
point where we become the express image of him and that we put on the mind of Christ, right? And we're far from it. God is helping us to build character so that we can make it into the kingdom of God, so that we can be more like him and live you know, th this eternal life with him and, and be like him in that same way so that we can all get along in peace and harmony. He goes on in verse 7, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Our physical father disciplines us for reason. All right? It's for our own good. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You, 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 like you don't have a father. Because this is what father does. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Right? We honor them anyway. And again, when you get older, you understand, you appreciate why your father said, don't run into the road without looking both ways or talk to me or only go with me when you're crossing this busy, dangerous road. It's for our own good. And when we don't do it, yeah, sometimes we have to have a little attention getter so that we don't do it next time. And it pays off. For they indeed, for a few days, and our life is but a short time, relatively speaking, chastened us as seemed best to them. They weren't always perfect. They tried to do the best they could, but it wasn't necessarily always the best, unlike the way that God does it. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. And that's what we're talking about. So that we can become a part of the family of God. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Right. This is why God punishes. This is why he chastens. This is why he corrects. This is why he disciplines. It's in love. Okay, because he wants the best for us, and he knows how to go about getting that. This is why the Jews went into captivity in Babylon. Okay? It's why the Israelites went into captivity in Assyria. Okay? It was for a purpose. Okay? They were not living the right way. They needed the correction, and they came back out of it. And, to a large degree, they changed in a lot of ways. Not perfectly and the best that they could without God's Holy Spirit in them. But nonetheless, nonetheless, it did have a certain effect. And they always remembered that. Well, as it is, as our children do forget, you know, so will the Jews and the Israelites. They will also forget. But nonetheless, God's still going to be there to do what is best for them. So now back to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 1. We come to part three. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came. So we see, again, kind of offsetting this, this section again. Now, as you'll recall, the book of Zechariah contains more Messianic scriptures than the other 11 minor prophets combined. It also talks about the second coming of Christ extensively as well. So the first coming and the second coming. Now, Chapter 8 here is largely a millennial setting. Okay, it's this thousand year reign of Christ following his return, the immediate return. When he comes and he, he accomplishes the things that he does immediately in terms of putting down the nations and then uh, so on and so forth, the beginning of the millennium, the beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ that Revelation 20 talks about. That again, his first fruit, those of us who are called now, who uh, accept that calling and live the life that we need to live, to, that we will then rule with him at that time as, again, we're, we're spiritual Jews, we'll be a part of his family, part of the God family at that time, ruling with him for that thousand years. Well, this is what this is talking about. So keep this in mind as we go through this, that he, he's talking to the, the Jews here in Jerusalem at this time, and he's telling them these things about not only the messianic, the first coming, but now he's going to talk about the second coming. And so perhaps we can sometimes see why they kind of get these two things mixed up a little bit 
in terms of being able to segregate the first from the second. So what we have, though, is human nature taking over again, and they focus on the second coming. You know, the, the, the first one wasn't glorious like it was. They didn't understand that Christ had to come and to be our Savior and our sacrifice and qualify. Before he could come, well, step back just a second, before the Holy Spirit could come, and then he could grow his family in that way, then he could return uh, in this the second return that, again, the Jews are still looking forward to. They missed the first one. They didn't recognize it in that sense they have denied Christ that he even came. And here we have you know these scriptures here, and a lot of them that they focus on, are the ones in the future when he ru- he returns with a, a rod of iron and he becomes king of kings and lord of lords and uh, you know all the f- kingdoms of this world will you know be squashed under his feet at that return. Well, again, yeah, they'd like that for him to come back and to save them, but again, they're focusing just on them as they were apt to do. So continuing in verse two of Zechariah eight, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion with great zeal, with great fervor, I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Okay, so that's not how Jesus Christ came the first time, nor is it what happened with his first coming. So you can see to a certain degree why the Jews were, okay, focused on this and not what they, uh, you know, they, they missed the first coming. So they, they tended to focus on this, the power and the might to deliver them, to bring the salvation, the peace that, again, they would rightly want and that we should all be wanting, but not the fact that he was coming in a lowly manner on a donkey, which I think we're going to get in on, on chapter 9. In fact, it's an interesting couple of verses in there in chapter 9, how it goes first coming, second com- coming in a matter of, you know, one verse and then the next verse. So, nonetheless, they didn't realize the necessity of this two-part coming of Christ. So the first coming had to happen so that the second one could come about. So when he returns in power and might to subdue the kingdoms of the world and make them his, he will then usher in this unparalleled time of peace and harmony and safety, as we see here in the next two verses, Zechariah 8, verses 4 and 5. Thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand, because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Now, it just so happens that, you know, recently in Israel, they were just bombarded with, with a whole bunch of rockets. Not the first time this has been going on, you know, in the Middle East for, you know, for, I mean, my whole life, basically. And that's just modern times. But what we see here is this future time when, you know, some people are so old that they need a staff to to kind of stand up. And there's little boys and girls playing, and they're all feeling safe. It's not a problem to live there and to do this. And you don't have to worry, you know, about any bad element within Israel or any bad element outside of Israel. Uh, Anybody wanting to kill them, bomb them, or anything. Because... This is the time then after Christ comes and he sets up his rule and it begins to prosper. His way, his, his word, the law goes out over the, the whole earth and, and people then start following it. And they have God's Holy Spirit, which is being made readily available to all mankind. And this is going to be the result of it. Now, the remnant... Now, this is at the very beginning of Christ returning, right? That, that the, the Jews, along with, you know, Israelites and other peoples, you know, they go into captivity again. The Jews do. This is what we're talking about, this duality. They were in captivity then. They're going to go into captivity. They're going to have to go through the Great Tribulation. They're going to be saved through the Day of the Lord, which is God's wrath on mankind. Great Tribulation is, again, God's wrath on his people, the spiritual Jews, the physical Jews, those who need to learn that lesson that we were talking about. Then, after the day of the Lord, we have the return of Jesus Christ. We have the second exodus that Jeremiah refers to, where all these people come out, and there's so many that it makes the first exodus pale in comparison, and they go to Jerusalem, and 
It's for Judah they're going there, and as well as Israel, who's never returned. They go. And it's this remnant that they call of the total amount that then go back to Jerusalem, and they're led there by Christ after his return. And we see this here in the next uh, verse or two. Zechariah 8, verse 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of his people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts? Yeah, so the people are going to rejoice, obviously, you know, being saved from this, and God will too. You know, this is what God really wants. He doesn't want to have to discipline I mean, any more than a parent wants to. Okay. He wants to look forward to them. He is looking forward to this time. And it's going to be marvelous in his eyes as well. Verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. So again, they're going to be scattered all around. Isaiah 11, 11, it says, Okay, it's going to come to pass in the day of the Lord. This is at the end. That he's going to set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria, that's in the north, Egypt, in the south, from Pathros and Cush and Elam and Shinar, which we talked about, you know, the land of Babylon, from Hamath, all right, so, you know, again, you got Shinar more to the east, and Hamath, and then the islands of the sea, all right? So there's going to be this uh, recovery even from the west, all right? So it's the east, the west, and other parts as well. Again, we take the Bible, we put it together a little here and a little there. And we see then, okay, yeah, it could be the east and the west. Now, I make a point of this because in Zechariah 6, 6 that we had talked about last time, that it says the white ones, the white horse is going after, and it looks like the black horse. Now, almost all the translations say, okay, yeah, they're both going to the north country. The black horse is going to the north country. The white are going after them. So it seems like they're going there because the dappled go to the south country. Well, you, we can make all kinds of assumptions, but and one of those assumptions is that people think that, again, let's say people, some of the translators think that the white it was going to the west. Well, I think it's difficult to make a case for that based on the grammar. If it is for some reason implying that the white horse is going to the west, then the case would, could be made for them meeting out justice here in terms of the white horse going out to conquer and, to, and conquering, that it could go out to the west because there are going to be things right there out to the west, right? It could be as far, it could be off the coast, or it could be as far as perhaps Greece, which I think Joel 3, 6 refers to, that the people of Judah and Jerusalem are, are being sold to the Greeks. They're being removed from their borders, right? And again, that's in prophecy, among other places. So anyway, I, I throw that in there to say, okay, yeah, th that's a possibility, though we see that there's going to be people there. I just don't know that Zechariah 6.6 6 is referring to the West. Nonetheless, you know, I, a lot of times after these things happen, we'll know that they happen. Now, in Jeremiah 30, verses 17 and 18, we can up and put that in your notes. In fact, I'll, we can go ahead and turn there real quick, just while we're on this, this concept of the, uh, the remnant and uh, the fact that they are going to return in Jeremiah 30, verses 17 and 18. Again, the, the, we're going over, and it's kind of a survey of these things. And each of these things, like I said before, they, they have a, a whole sermon that can be and has been you know, written and given on, these, on a lot of these subjects in terms of the millennium, in terms of the uh, return of Christ and captivity and whatnot. But Jeremiah 30, verse 17, just by way of throwing in a, I think, a solid scripture on the subject. For I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord, because they called you an outcast, saying, This is Zion, no one seeks her. Again, th this is where Christ is returning to, to Zion. That's where he dwells, where he wants to dwell. He says, I'm going to restore health and heal your wounds. Then verse 18, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring back the captivity of Jacob's tents and mercy on his dwelling places. The city shall be built on its own mound, and the palace shall remain according to its own plan. So again, there's going to be this bringing back of them again another time. They went into captivity into Babylon, 
and it's going to happen again. And it's going to be, again, part of it is going to be this uh, Babylon, the Babylonian system in the future that's going to, you know, exert its power on the people of God. And this is going to be the result. And again, it's because if you look over there right now, you look over at Israel and what's going on, and you look behind the scenes, you know, they're way off track, as far off track as I think that they have ever been. And so, yeah, it's going to happen for cause. So back to Zechariah 8 and verse 8. It says, I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. God will take a very close and personal approach to teaching and instructing his people during the millennium and specifically at the beginning of it. He's not going to be sequestered away into any corner anymore. He's going to be there and he's going to take this very personal approach with teaching his people, and that's along with the rest of the God family at that time. Verse 9 of Zechariah 8, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, you who have been hearing these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets who spoke in these days, the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord of hosts, that the temple might be built. All right, so here, here he is right on the heels of speaking to them, about him returning, and then God speaks of the temple because he wants to return to it. Now, the Jews are busy right now trying to build another temple, but it's not the temple that he truly wants to return to. It is to us. We are that temple. You know, again, 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, you know, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God, and I will dwell in them, is what God says. So yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yet the Jews are doing that, and I think it's a part of prophecy and the plan that, again, the man of sin sets himself up in the temple before the end, and then Christ returns. And I think that that's a part of it, that there's going to be at least a portion of it uh, that's going to be built before the return of Christ. So I think Scripture bears that out. But nonetheless, he's saying this right on the heels. Okay, by the words by the mouth of the prophet, speaking of, in particular, Haggai and Zechariah. So he says, again, by way of encouragement and on the heels of saying, okay, here's the the, the stuff that's going to happen in the millennium and this thousand-year reign that's coming. And so I think in the mind of the Jew that's reading this or seeing this, he's going, okay, man, we, we've got to get busy building the temple like God said because we want to be doing what we're supposed to be doing so that we can usher in this time and this age and that we can be accounted worthy if we're around at that time, to, you know, to, again, to be saved, to be helped, to be taught, etc., etc., of course. And who doesn't want that from Christ when he returns? Now, verse 10, for, beho- for before these days there were no wages for man, nor any hire for beast. There was no peace from the enemy. For whoever went out or came in, for I set all men, everyone against his neighbor, all right, so again, this hand in hand with the previous verse in terms of what was happening with the temple at the time. That you know, again, the reason why Haggai and Zechariah were sent was to encourage them to continue to build because they had stopped. They weren't doing what they were supposed to. They were focusing on their own things, and because of that, all right, these things in verse ten were happening. Right, that uh, the the problems, the curses that came with not doing what God said to do, right? but. When they listened and followed the will and word of God, it went well for them, in particular with the rebuilding of the temple. And they were to continue rebuilding. So he kind of throws that in. But then, okay, now in the next verses, 11 through 13, we're back to talking about the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth with mankind. Verse 11 says, But now, okay, in the millennium, I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. All right, so again, he's going to have a, a different approach because it's a millennium, because they're going to have uh, God's Holy Spirit made available to them, because they're no longer going to be simply this physical people, right? He's going to be able to treat them in a different way because they're going to have that soft heart that the law can be written upon and they can act different and will be different. Verse 12, for the seed shall be prosperous. The vine shall give its fruit. The ground 
shall give her increase. The heavens shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all of these. Again, it's contrast to the way it was there in verse 10 when things were not going right because they were not living the right way. In verse 13, it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear. Let your hands be strong. Again, that little last little bit of encouragement again about the temple. But what we see here, particularly in verse 13, is another telltale sign that this is yet in the future because Israel is mentioned, this house of Israel. Israel, when they went into captivity some 130 years before Judah did, they went into Assyria and then they scattered from there. And for the most part, nobody came back to Israel. So there's going to be this time when God brings them back and he brings back the remnant because not only will the Jews go into captivity, but Israel we're going to captivity. And again, just a little spoiler alert to the, the other message, which you probably have already heard, but Israel, modern day Israel, is the United States and British Commonwealth. Right? That's who it is. If you trans if you follow it down from, from Joseph when he says, Let Israel's name be named on his uh, children, and he, he switched his hands over with Ephraim and Manasseh. And then they became this great nation and company of nations, as Genesis talks about. I think it's Genesis 48, 49. And then they became Israel. That, that's who Israel is today. That's who the blessings of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are upon. And I think that it's readily seen. And again, like I said before, we've talked about that in the past. But they are going into captivity as well as the Jews who live in the land of Israel, not to be confused with the house of Israel. So we see that this is yet in the future when this remnant is going to be brought back. All right? So the Jews are living there now. Again, they're going to be scattered. They're going to go into captivity. And then they're all going to return. But that's going to have to wait for Christ to return and to save them at that time. Now in verses 14 through 17, we see that God wants the best for his people. You know, he says, verse 14, For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I determined to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I would not relent, so again in these days I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Do not fear. Again, they had already gone into captivity. All right, so they're coming back, and God wants to do good, right? That's what we were talking about a little bit before, is that, yeah, this is going to, supposed to be a marvelous time, not just for the people, but for God as well, when people are listening and everybody's getting along and there's peace and harmony, right? Well, that's what he wants for the future as well. In verse 16, these are the things you shall do, okay? If you want to bring that about, if you want to make these things happen, I'm telling you now, okay, to the Jews who just come out of Babylon, and it's for us and it's for everybody in the future as well. This is the way that he wants them, us, and everyone to live. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice, and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. Okay, so not against God, nor against your brother or your neighbor. And do not love a false oath, for all these are things that I hate, says the Lord your God. So do these things, don't do these things. It's a synopsis. Again, it's not everything that there is. They had, they know what they are supposed to be doing. They had the law. They had the Torah. And they, they know what they're supposed to be doing. This is by way of reminder, and, and perhaps even more specific to some of the things that were going on at that time. So now finally, part four. In Zechariah 8 and verse 18 through the end. Here it says then that the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying. So we have that phrase again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. Therefore love, truth, and peace. So we come full circle back to the whole fasting thing. So again, 
The fasting on the fourth month fell in the ninth uh, month of Tammuz. It was the day when the city walls were breached. You can find that in 2 Kings 25, verses 3 through 4. And then the fast of the tenth month fell on the tenth of Tibet. And that was the day when the king of Babylon had laid siege to Jerusalem. And you'll find that just above the, the last fast in 2 Kings 25 and verse 1. So you see these, again, these four events that they were fasting for were, again, all having to do with the, the Babylonian invasion, captivity, and events that were going on at that time. But he says, okay, at this time in the future, when I return, it's going to be joy and gladness and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. There's not going to be this commemoration of these horrible acts that had happened, okay, that were not necessarily uh, biblical. These are not a part of the holy days, not of the commanded days, like perhaps the Day of Atonement, which, again, not to be confused with what happened in the seventh month, but that happened at Atonement, which was one of the feast days of God. It's a joyous time that he's talking about here. Okay, and, and I think we perhaps might see that too when, when Christ was talking uh, to some of the, um, I can't remember who it was, Pharisees probably or scribes, and they, they were asking, well, why do your guys not fast? And it could have been a reference to these things as well as other fasts that they had talked about. But he says, look, when the bridegroom's here with you, you know, then you don't need to fast. But when, I, when the bridegroom's taken away, speaking of himself, when he was going to be resurrected, die and be resurrected, he says, then they'll fast. So again, it was to draw closer to God, but if God was there, then there was no need for it. So again, when God's on earth, when he returns, then presumably the need to fast, to draw closer to God, is going to be replaced then with feast, with joy and gladness as everybody lives that way and they are closer to God. So then he goes, okay, because of these things, therefore, love, truth, and peace. So seek these things. Again, more little things of directional instruction given to the people of what they need to be doing, what they need to be thinking on, what their motivation needs to be. This is the way that leads to a better life for everyone, right? And it's interesting too, this is kind of the way he started off at the beginning of the chapter. He says, I'm going to return and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, which means city of peace, and shall, it shall be called the city of truth. So the city of peace shall be called the city of truth. He says, love, truth, and peace. Right? That's where I want you to be focused on. Again, Zechariah kind of picks up where Haggai kind of left off to a certain degree. Haggai was talking about the temple. Zechariah is talking about the temple and Jerusalem, making it a place where, okay, it represents me. You're an example. People want to come to it, and I want people to come to it, so you need to be setting that right example. So, Seek peace and pursue it. So there's coming a time then that it's not going to be just for the Jews and not just for the Israelites either, okay? This is a plan for all mankind that God is working out. It's a fair and just plan. And we continue to see this in Zechariah 8, verses 20 through 23 to end the chapter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples shall come, shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. And this is the way that it used to be. And it's going to be that way again. These inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. So it was that way. It used to be that way around Jerusalem and the cities around Jer Jerusalem. But here we're going to see. Now it's going to expand. It's going to expand out from there to the rest of the world. Verse 22, Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. Like they've heard so many times in the past, and yet the Jews, the Israelites, have not lived up to what they're supposed to be. That example nation that had God's rules and God's laws and God's protection and God with them. 
and yet they continue to always go astray. In the future, it's going to be different. It's going to be this wonderful time when God will rule on the earth from this world headquarter in Jerusalem, and all peoples will come to it to learn the better way. And his people will be a good example this time for them to follow.